Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Glaze webinar series. My name is Eric Matos. I'm the executive director of the Greenhouse Lighting and Systems Engineering Consortium, and I will be your host today. The Glaze Consortium webinar series is a selection of live recorded online presentations that cover a broad range of topics at varying technical levels and scale. These webinars feature the latest technological innovations and best practices in the CEA field, providing the audience the opportunity to discover new solutions and to connect with field experts. Today, we're gonna to do something a little bit different. Before or during my introduction uh, from the two speakers today, I will launch our first poll to get an idea of our audience today. So the poll is in your screen. Go ahead, answer the questions while we introduce uh, our speakers today, and we're gonna check the results when I'm done here. So today, we'll hear from Dr. AJ Bolt, from Rutgers University and Dr. Neil Matson from Cornell University about horticultural lighting systems energy savings calculations. Dr. AJ Bolf is an engineering by training with degrees from Wageningen University in the Netherlands and Cornell University. Dr. AJ Bolf now serves on the faculty in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers University as professor and extension specialist. His research focuses on methods and systems to provide optimum growing environment in protected plant production facilities. Dr. Neil Madsen is an associate professor in the School of Integrative Plant Science, having joined Cornell University in 2007. He serves as a statewide greenhouse specialist with research and outreach programs focusing on the physiology of both vegetable and flower crops. His work emphasizes strategies to optimize crop production while reducing energy to improve lighting and greenhouse control systems, plant mineral nutrition, and plant stress physiology. And I would like to make a special note today, uh, just say that uh, I have the privilege to work with both Dr. AJ Both and Dr. Neil Matson as they are members of the Glaze Academic Research Team. A record version of this webinar will be available at our website at glaze.org, where you can find all the previous webinars and also register for the upcoming ones. If you have any questions about the presentation or would like to get in contact with the speakers, please submit your inquiries using the Q&A box during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer all your questions at the end of the session today. With that said, I would like to thank AJ and you for being our presenters today and pass the word to Dr. A.J. Both. A.J. Thank you, Erico, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. Um, we decided to split this presentation up in two parts. Uh, I'll be the opening act, and then Neil will do the heavy lifting and be the closing act. So I'll start off first, and my first slide, um, um, if, if Eero can remove, there you go. My first slide is um, uh, an overview and some introductory comments about supplemental lighting. We all know that lighting is expensive. Luminaires are expensive, and especially the newer LED technologies. Some of the lamps can be two times or maybe three times more expensive as the previous uh, high-intensity discharge technology. Um, we, have, we need relatively high intensities, um, but that's not easy to do with the lamps that we have. If you compare the output of the lamps with uh, solar radiation. And as a result, uh, we require many hours of lighting on dark days to meet the certain lighting target that we often want to provide for our crops. So lighting is expensive, but on the flip side, uh, lighting also facilitates year-round production. We can grow throughout the uh, darker seasons and, and therefore be in production uh, throughout the year. Uh, lighting has the opportunity to significantly improve crop timing, so it is easier to grow a crop in, the, in a limited amount of time. And in many cases, lighting, especially during the darker months of the year, will also add to the plant quality. We can do a variety of spectral manipulations, and that's becoming more easy now with LED lighting technology, that we can use to enhance a variety of plant traits. We can try to uh, increase certain phytochemicals. We can try to uh, uh, add some crunch to certain uh, leafy greens that we want to market. All these things are possible by manipulating the spectrum, and that has that's a certain advantage to using lighting uh, for crops. 
And then uh, something that's often overlooked but could be a benefit, although it could be a, a detriment too. Uh, lighting uh, generates a fair amount of heat, waste heat. Uh, most lighting systems are only about 30 to 40 percent efficient in converting electricity into useful light for plant growth. So 70, 60 to 70 percent of the energy that goes into the system is converted into heat. And if heating is needed in our growing systems, that heat can be a benefit. Obviously, when that heat is not needed, it's, it's a detriment. We need to remove it, and, and that typically uh, adds to the expense of the entire system. So how can we calculate lighting costs? This is a question that we often get from growers um, because they want to know what to expect, and they want to perhaps start to compare different lighting systems that they find on the marketplace to see if any one of them is more suitable for their operation. So I list uh, three different steps here uh, in, in different, uh, that can be used for different types of calculations. Um, I'm gonna say a few things about what I call a tedious way, which requires a lot more data, but Neil is gonna do the heavy lifting on that in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the simplified way where uh, a lot less data is required um, to do the calculation and I also would like to talk a little bit about uh, a way to compare how you could grow different crops and what the lighting implications for those crops are in terms of cost um, so that we can, we can determine whether it makes more sense to invest in a lighting system for crop A versus a different lighting system for crop B. So a few words about the more tedious way. As I mentioned, that requires more data. We typically need to look at outside historical radiation data uh, those are available from weather stations or, for example, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. Uh, there's a, a, a database online available that you can use and download a bunch of data for locations and then use that as a reference to what you might expect at a particular site. Clearly, these are historic data, so there are no guarantees that uh, the light conditions will be exactly the same as what happened in the past, but it is an indication of what is uh, likely to happen at a particular site. Next thing we need to know is how much of that light that we have measured outside is actually getting through the structure and eventually getting to the crop. So we need to know something about the transmission uh, and that is not as easy as it sounds and I'm having a few more words to say about that coming up. Um, we need to compare um, how much light we would like to provide to our crop to how much light we actually get into the greenhouse and then by uh, looking at the difference, we can then determine how much light we need to add. And if we know the available intensity of the lighting system that we have installed, we can then determine how many hours we need to operate the lighting system in order to provide the daily target integral uh, that we want to provide for the crop. And then once we know the operating hours, if we know how many lamps we have installed and how much wattage they draw from the electric system, and we know the electricity price, uh, that you typically can find from your local utility company, then you can determine the overall cost. So it is a, it's a quite of an extensive uh, set of steps that you need to go through to calculate uh, in this, uh, following this uh, set of uh, guidelines uh, to determine how much it's going to cost you to, uh, to light uh, your crop. I have an asterisk there on the bottom. Um, there are uh, specific additional issues that you want to look at for electricity pricing. It would be easy if it was a, a fixed price throughout the day or throughout the year. That's typically not the case. Many local utilities use an on-peak and an off-peak pricing schedule. Uh, sometimes they uh, calculate a demand charge based on the maximum uh, power consumption, typically over a short amount of time. Uh, and we also have, of course, crops that require us the spectral considerations for the reasons I, I outlined in the, in the first graph, in the first slide, uh, and, and those all can change the pricing schedule uh, that you need to follow. So using one fixed price is easy, but uh, typically in reality, we need to do a little bit more uh, calculations to use the actual pricing that is uh, used by the power company. So. One way of looking at and determining how much light is available for a particular location is looking at pictures like this, where colleagues from Clemson University, Jim Faust, and a graduate student um, uh, developed uh, these light maps, 
where for every month of the year they calculated using this, this data set from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, that consists of around uh, 240, 250 individual locations across the United States. They determined what the light conditions were looking at a, a bunch of uh, years, so historical data, and then uh, they calculated for those locations what for each month of the year the light conditions were, and then using some software, they can extrapolate that for the entire uh, uh, territory of the United States. So here you're looking at the maps for each month of the year, and the color scheme is indicating how much light in terms of moles per meter square per day you can expect based again on the historical data for many locations all locations across the united states so this is one way of finding historical data uh, you may be lucky that for your location uh, you have data available like this uh, i'm located in new jersey so i picked the site that i have access to um, that's newark new jersey very close to new york city and for a, a data set of 11 years, I determined the daily light integral in moles per meter square per day, indicated by an individual dot in this graph. So you're looking at 365 days multiplied by 11 dots in this graph. Each dot is indicating the light integral for a single day during that 11-year period. And then the black line that you see drawn here is the average over the entire year. So you could go to the light maps that I showed you in the previous slide, or you could go to more detailed information for a particular site as you see in this graph. And you may be lucky that you have access to weather data nearby that you can use to assess the light conditions at your site. I mentioned that we need, also need to know the light transmission through the growing structure, and uh, that is, as I mentioned, not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it depends on a variety of, of uh, issues that I list here in the slide, time of year, location and orientation of the structure, the angle of the roof, the type of glazing material, the structural design, and whether you have any components inside, heating pipes and curtains and things like that, uh, overhead equipment, irrigation equipment, lighting systems, and whether you uh, use an energy or a shade curtain. So you need to take it into consideration to figure out how much of the light that you have measured or have recorded outside is actually getting through the structure uh, to the crops that you are uh, growing in your greenhouse. And um, as I said, it's not as easy to calculate that for specifically specific times and specific locations. But we typically use average values, and you see at the bottom of the slide here, uh, that those values are in the order of 50 to 70 percent. So you lose quite a bit of light uh, through your structure and that's something that you need to be aware of. It's, it's, uh, it's very different the light environment inside a structure compared to what you measure outside. So I, I continue now talking about a simplified way of uh, calculating lighting cost, and that is based on a paper that Cherry Kubota uh, presented four years ago at the lighting conference in Michigan, Michigan State. Uh, and the paper you see on the bottom of the slide is available. If you can't get access to it, let me know, and I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, that simplified uh, calculation method requires only four input parameters. The power consumption of an individual lamp, which is something you can find on the box or call a company, the lighting manufacturer, about and ask them about. You need to know the luminaire efficacy in micromoles per joule. That's also data that is typically available from a lighting manufacturer you need to know uh, the expected light loss. In other words, the amount of light that you know or expect is not reaching the plant canopy. Um, that costs you money, but it's not helping you grow plants. So you need to incorporate that in your calculations. And you need to figure out what the electricity price is uh, for your power at your location. So using these four input parameters and then picking a lamp wattage of 450, and I assumed a light loss of 10%. I can calculate on the left-hand side in, in graph number A what the lamp density is based on the luminaire efficacy that, are, that you see on the horizontal axis. Um, and so an efficacy of one is perhaps something like an incandescent lamp that we no longer use, and an efficacy of three is the very best uh, LED system that you can buy in the, in the, on the market today. 
So you see here for different light intensities that you want to use to provide your crop with a particular uh, light environment, you can then calculate how many lamps per square meter you need to install based on the efficacy and based on the light intensity that you'd like to provide. And then uh, with that information about the land density, you can then on the right hand side calculate the electricity cost. You can do it in different ways. On, in the picture that I show you on the right hand side, I calculated in dollars per mole of light. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you can also calculate electricity cost in dollars per meter square per hour. So depending on your preference for the unit, uh, you can calculate uh, in either way, but you get in both cases very similar lines based on a set of a range of electricity prices that you see identified in the box here. So somebody may be lucky and pay only nine cents a kilowatt hours here in the Northeast. We're not so lucky and we're closer to 17 cents per kilowatt hour. And I know some areas pay even more. So based on the electricity price that you pay, based on the luminaire efficacy, that you get from the manufacturer and the 450 watt lamp and the 10% light loss, these are the electricity costs that you can calculate uh, for your lighting system. So it's a fairly simple approach. I have a spreadsheet available and I'd be happy to share it with you if you'd like to uh, use it for your own uh, situation. The next slide shows you that you could consider the waste heat that's being produced by the lighting system and uh, you could calculate what the benefit of that uh, waste heat is, assuming that that heat can actually be used to help offset the cost of your heating system in your greenhouse. So of course, if, if the, heat, the heat that is produced by the lamps is not useful because the greenhouse is already at the, uh, the right temperature, then this is not a, a benefit. But here I assume that it is a benefit. And then based on heating fuel prices, uh, calculated in dollars per kilowatt hour. So you may have to convert if you use uh, fuel oil or if you use natural gas to calculate the cost per kilowatt hour equivalent. But here you can see what the benefit would be again uh, for a range of luminaire efficacies on the horizontal axis. So this could then be subtracted from the lighting cost that I calculated in the previous slide if you feel that uh, that waste heat can be a benefit to you. The last uh, point I wanted to make is that we can also uh, calculate the cost per unit of crop yield. And uh, that's typically done for comparisons for growers who want to decide whether they want to grow one crop versus another crop and how much difference the cost would be uh, for, uh, for growing these crops. And the typical units that we use for yields are dollars per kilogram. And typically that's a fresh weight, not a dry weight. And for most crops, uh, it turns out that there's a, a linear relationship as you see in this graph for lettuce and tomatoes. Um, there's a linear relationship between the total amount of light, the accumulated light that the plants received from the day they were put in the greenhouse until the day you harvested them, them and the yield that you get out of a crop. So I, I calculated that based on data from my own dissertation way back when, and also from the paper that Jerry Kubota published in 2016 for tomatoes. And you can see here the two different lines that you get with the different slopes indicating how much uh, fresh mass production is possible per mole of light and this is now a, a sum of light, so it could be supplemental light if it was only supplemental lighting, or it is a combination of sunlight and supplemental if you uh, grow your crop in a greenhouse. This relationship uh, is, is very common and very typical, and we can use this relationship then to calculate the, uh, the costs for lighting your crop, which is done in the next slide. Um, so we use the electricity costs that we calculated in dollars per mole from the graph that I showed you earlier. I, I named them A, B, C, and D. Uh, we can subtract any heating costs that I showed you. We can divide that by the slope then of the relationship between yield and accumulated light that was shown in the last slide. Uh, and then you can calculate what the lighting cost is in dollars per kilogram of biomass. And I calculated that on the left-hand side for lettuce crop based again on the data that I got from my dissertation research. And on the right-hand side, it's for a tomato crop 
uh, that came from data that was published by Jerry Kubota in her paper. And then you can start comparing. You can see that there's clearly a difference in lighting cost for a, a range of efficiencies, but also when you compare the lettuce crop versus the tomato crop. The lettuce crop looks like it's cheaper uh, to produce for a unit of biomass compared to the tomato crop. Um, so that is, a, is a, in a way of comparing these two different crops, and it could be one factor that you want to weigh into your decision whether it makes more sense to grow lettuce or to grow uh, tomatoes. So with that, I'll close, and I'll hand it over to Neil. Thanks, AJ. Uh, Neil, you ready for? Good day, everyone. Yeah, yeah. I'll share my screen here, and we'll get going. Thanks, AJ. Welcome, Neil. Okay. okay. Do you see my slides? Okay, Erica. Yes, we're seeing uh, not the presenter mode. We see. I have to mention these slides. I guess I see all your slides on the left side. Oh, okay. Uh, let me do that. How about now? No, still, yeah, now, now we see, perfect. Okay, perfect, good, well, good. Thanks. Good day, everyone. Good, so then AJ has tasked me to talk about the uh, tedious side of calculation. So thank you, AJ. Um, so I wanna talk first about um, how you might uh, decide the target light intensity. So if you're, if you're interested in installing lights in your greenhouse or retrofitting your greenhouse with lights, um, how do we know how much lighting capacity to talk about? So AJ's graphs had examples ranging from say 50 micromoles per meter squared per second of uh, photosynthetically active light all the way up to maybe 200 uh, micromoles. So we need to know some information in this, in this approach we need to know the target daily light integral for your crop. We need to know how many hours a day those lights can be on. Uh, and then we need to know um, how much sunlight we can get um, even on our worst days. Um, and this might not necessarily be your absolute worst day of the year. You could consider installing lighting capacity for your worst day of the year so that even on a, on a really bad January day, you could still give your crop adequate light um, but you might say that, that on average, um, uh, you won't have so many of those worst days a year. So uh, what you could also do is look at um, um, the lowest DLI based on weather station, um, or you could look at uh, what are the 10% most extreme cases for your lowest daily light integral. So maybe um, your lowest uh, day in January might be one or two moles like it is here in, in upstate New York but maybe your lowest 10% of cases that averages out to be uh, four moles of light. And then you could use that as your, your minimum ambient to daily light integral. Another approach could be to look at the monthly average calendar and AJ showed nice examples of those, um, but then also account for your greenhouse uh, transmittance, which, which might be only 70% uh, or 50% of sunlight that actually makes it into your greenhouse. Uh, and you'll remember I often show this, this graph, the, the different crops that we grow have different target uh, daily light integral needs. So on the lower side would be bedding plants um, or flowering potted plants. It is species dependent, but one of the average metrics we'll use is about 10 or 12 moles of light. For lettuce and herbs, for, for head lettuce, we often talk about 17 moles with good airflow. Um, is about the maximum DLI target that you'll want uh, because of leaf tip burn. Um, some lettuce crops are more sensitive, like romaine, you may need to have an even slightly lower than 17 um, mole target. Uh, then we run into our fruiting vegetables, which uh, use decently more light. And so we're often looking at 30 moles of light to be optimum for uh, yielding for cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers um, with a 15 or 20 mole minimum. And for strawberries, uh, 15 mole minimum um, and 20 or more moles uh, to get optimum yielding out of our crop. Um, so this is, this is one piece that we need to have in mind. Um, and then this would be one of those tedious calculations that you can do. So um, in this equation, we need to know the target daily light integral, and then we subtract from that the minimum ambient daily light integral. So how much we could get from the sun even on those low light days. 
And then we need to divide that by the number of hours a day that we can have the lights on. So in the case of lettuce, uh, you can actually light the crop uh, 24 hours continuously. So you could spread that light out over a 24 hour period of time. Um, in the case of many of our fruiting crops, for example, for tomatoes and uh, peppers, we need to have a four to six hour dark period. Otherwise we can get physiological disorders that occur for that crop. So we, we uh, do that top calculation and that will give us the um, target daily or the target hourly light integral that we need to achieve with our installed lighting capacity. Uh, and then we just need to do a conversion um, to get the light integral units from moles uh, per meter squared per hour into micromoles per meter squared per second. So we need to multiply our hourly light integral by a million to uh, convert um, uh, moles into micromoles and then we need to divide that by 3600 seconds per hour and that will show us our target uh, uh, lighting capacity in micromoles per meter squared per second that we need to install. So here's an example for tomatoes uh, with an 18 hour photo period and we have a target daily light integral of 20 moles per meter squared per day. And let's say we've decided on, on a not so great sunlight day, we still get a minimum of five moles per meter squared per day. So what we do is we take uh, 20 and we subtract five um, and then divide that by the 18 hours that we're able to light in a day. So that tells us that we need uh, lights that can supply 0.83 moles per meter squared per hour. Um, then we do these conversions, so multiply times a million um, and divide by 3600. And it tells us that we need an installed lighting capacity of 231 micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, so you can work with your uh, lighting manufacturer to um, select uh, lights and lighting configuration um, that, will, that will give you this target value. One of the conversations you'll want to have with your lighting manufacturer is the um, decay rate that will occur over time. So the, the fixtures will um, lose light output a bit over time based on the number of hours that they are operated. So you might install an even greater lighting capacity so that three years from now or five years from now, you can still achieve uh, sufficient uh, daily light integral. So one of the, uh, one of my colleagues who's now at the USDA ARS in Toledo, Ohio is Kale Harbeck and he was formerly at Cornell University um, and he took uh, uh, weather data from across the US and similar to the, the maps that AJ showed, um, he then thought about them in terms of what actually enters the greenhouse um, and then um, how much of that light uh, or then based on how much light we get into the greenhouse, how much supplemental light do we need to add to get um, our um, mole uh, daily light integral target um, every day of the year. So here's an example for uh, greenhouse lettuce uh, with uh, 17 mole per meter squared per day daily light integral target. Um, and then we have the scenario on the left, which is a double poly greenhouse, which has not quite as good light transmittance. So 62% of the light from the sun actually makes it into the greenhouse. Um, and then we have a single layer of glass on the right side with 70% light transmittance. And so this will show us uh, the number of uh, moles of supplemental light that we need over the course of a year. So if we look at like the US Southwest, um, our crop will need uh, less than 500 moles of light uh, per year. If we look at the North and the Northeast, um, then we need often more like uh, 1500 to 2000 moles of light per year. And we'll discuss how we can use this information in these more tedious calculations uh, in a few minutes here. Here's another uh, map. Um, this one was created for uh, the case of tomatoes. Uh, and uh, with tomatoes, we chose a 25 mole target. Uh, again, with a uh, double poly greenhouse with 62% transmittance on the left, or a glass greenhouse with 70% transmittance on the right. And in this case, because we have a quite a bit larger mole target for light, um, you'll see that the number of uh, moles that we need over the course of the year has gone up quite a bit. So in the northern part of the US or the northeast part of the US, 
we need more like 3,000 to 3,500 uh, moles of light. Um, and in the uh, southwest of the US, um, the very southern part of California, Arizona, and New Mexico, we need less than 500 moles. Um, but then there's a swath that we need uh, between 500 and 1,000 moles of light. Okay, so then um, how can we estimate the number of hours per year that our lights would have to be turned on based on these maps, such as, such as those that Dr. Kale Harbick has generated? Um, so what we need to do is um, identify your location. Um, and uh, so far we, we have these maps based on lettuce and tomato. Uh, Kale will be releasing a broader set of maps um, shortly. Um, so you would identify your location um, and the approximate moles of light that you need. Um, and then the lighting hours per year would be the moles required per year divided by your installed lighting capacity, which we just talked about how to calculate. Um, and then in terms of conversions, we have to multiply that times 3,600 uh, seconds per hour, and then multiply that times a million um, to convert uh, micromoles uh, to moles. Um, and so I want to introduce a scenario, and I'll talk about this um, for the next several minutes here, where we're looking at lighting a lettuce crop in either Minneapolis, Minnesota, or in Richmond, Virginia. And we want a 17 mole per meter squared per day daily light integral target. So um, if we look at the map, um, it appears we'll need about 1,750 moles per year in Minneapolis. Um, this is with a glass greenhouse. Uh, with 70% uh, transmittance. Um, and in Richmond, Virginia, we'll need about 1,000 um, moles per year. Then let's say we have already done calculations, uh, like I described earlier, to determine our installed lighting intensity. Um, and in the case of uh, Minneapolis, because we need almost twice as many moles of light, of supplemental light to be provided, um, our calculation showed us that we, that we needed 200 micromoles of light uh, per meter squared per second. So a fairly large uh, lighting installation in a greenhouse. And in the case of Richmond, Virginia, um, we are going to use an installed lighting capacity of 100 micromoles per meter squared per second. So in terms of estimating the lighting hours per year, then we can use the calculation I just mentioned so um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we need to light 1,750 moles per year. Um, we divide that by our lighting capacity of 200 micromoles per meter squared per second. Um, and then to do our conversions, we have to multiply times 3,600. Um, uh, so so 1,750 divided by 200 times 3,600. And then we need to multiply that, that by 1 million micromoles per mole. And this will tell us that uh, in this configuration, we need to have our lights on for 2,430 hours per year. Um, and if we divide that by 365, um, we uh, on average would have our lights on for 6.66 hours per day. Uh, granted, most of those hours will occur in the uh, winter season and relatively few would occur in the summer season. And uh, we can look at that same scenario for Richmond, Virginia. So in this case, we have 1,000 moles of light that we need to supply. We have an installed lighting capacity of 100 micromoles per meter squared per second. And so um, that tells us that we would have the lights on for 2,778 hours per year, or an average of 7.61 hours per day. Now, this might seem a little bit strange that our lights have to be on for a bit more time than lights in Minneapolis. But remember, this installed lighting capacity is half of the installed lighting capacity of uh, Minneapolis. So we're only getting half of the, the light output. So um, to achieve the same daily light integral, these, these lights have to be on for, for twice as long as the light installation in Minneapolis. Okay, so, um, so far in our scenario, um, we have our required supplemental light. Uh, we know our installed light intensity, and then we've calculated uh, the number of hours of supplemental light that we need per year. Um, the next thing that I want to do is look at um, a hypothetical scenario for uh, high pressure sodium lights and for LED lights 
um, and we'll estimate the light fixtures needed and the electricity cost. So um, I do have an Excel tool that can make this, this tedious part of the calculation relatively straightforward. Um, I'll also tell you how to do it by hand. Um, I have an extension bulletin on that. Um, so if you go to our Cornell CEA website, um, which if you like visiting our website, you'll see we recently changed our, um, we've updated our website, we've entered the 21st century. Um, you can still use our old address, cea.cals.cornell.edu to find us, um, and that will point you to blogs.cornell.edu slash cornellcea. Then if you go to the lighting section, um, you'll see the second link is this Excel tool for calculating uh, fixtures needed and electricity cost. So in um, this tool, you'll fill in your target instantaneous light intensity. Uh, you need to know information from the lighting manufacturers, and I'll, I'll talk more about this with our hypothetical examples in a minute here. So in particular, what you need to know are the, the lamp's uh, light output, um, which is a number they'll give you in micromoles per second. So that's the, that's the total quantity of uh, photosynthetically active light that a lamp will uh, put out. Um, then we need to know the area that we're lighting um, in square feet. Uh, we need to know the efficacy of the lamp. Um, in this tool, I have it listed in moles per kilowatt hour. Um, that's an easy conversion. If we, um, if we know the efficacy in micromoles per joule, which is what the manufacturers will commonly tell you, you just need to multiply that times 3.6 to get um, efficacy in moles per kilowatt hour. So in this, in this hypothetical example, it's a light with uh, 1.71 uh, micromoles per joule efficacy we multiply that times 3.6, um, and the efficacy in moles per kilowatt hour is 6.16. Uh, then uh, one can decide if you want to account for light loss from edge effects, but often, especially if you have um, a greenhouse with more perimeter space and not a, a large gutter connected greenhouse with a uniform crop stand, um, you might have a significant percentage of light that's lost to edges or aisleways. Um, and so we just plugged in 10% uh, in the case of, of the scenario. Um, then you would fill in the number of hours a day that the lights are on, as well as your cost of electricity. And then what the spreadsheet will calculate for you is um, uh, the lamp power consumption, the lamps that you need either if we don't consider edge effects. Um, so with this particular lamp, we would need 929 of them uh, to fill a one acre greenhouse. If we include edge effects, we would need 1,053 of these lights. Um, then it tells us the daily light integral we, would, we could get from having those lights on for seven hours a day, um, and then the electricity cost of having those uh, 1,033 lights on for um, seven hours per day. Um, if you like doing these tedious calculations by hand, um, I have an extension bulletin that's available at egrow.org. If you go to alerts and edibles, it will walk you through the, the pencil calculations, which, which really aren't that bad, actually. Um, a bit of disclaimers about using this method is it doesn't tell you um, how to place the fixtures in your greenhouse. It's just a rough estimate based on the light output of each light and its, and its energy usage we can calculate roughly how many fixtures you need to reach the, um, the lighting target um, that you have. Uh, and so this doesn't tell you how to place the fixture, so it doesn't tell you about the light distribution of the fixtures. And for that, you need to work with a lighting supplier um, and they can work with you on a professional lighting plan for how to um, install and space the, the light fixtures in your greenhouse. So if we continue on with our um, scenario with uh, Minneapolis and Richmond, um, let's say that we're, we're looking at two different types of lights. Um, these are hypothetical fixtures, but let's say we have a high pressure sodium light that's a single ended uh, electronic ballast, and we have a fixture output of not quite 1100 micromoles per second, uh, and we have a power consumption of 700 watts. So it's essentially a 600 watt high pressure sodium light, um, but the, um, the uh, power source um, takes an additional 100 uh, watts. Um, so the efficacy in this case is 1.56 micromoles per joule. 
um, and the cost of the, these fixtures are $300 each. Um, then we'll compare this to a hypothetical um, LED bar. Um, and these bars or top lights are becoming more common in um, greenhouse installations. Um, each one is fairly high powered and they might be about uh, 200 watts or so. So in this hypothetical case, we have 620 micromoles of light output, um, 207 watts of power consumption, and an efficacy of three micromoles per joule. This would be on kind of the high end of what we're seeing reported um, from lighting manufacturers currently for LED bars. Um, and the cost of one of these bars is $400 each. So if we use our uh, lighting uh, lamps needed uh, calculator, um, it will tell us that we need for these high pressure sodium lights, um, 742 fixtures per acre in Minneapolis. That's because we have a 200 micromole uh, per meter squared per second light target. In um, Richmond, we only need half as many lights in that same one acre greenhouse because we have um, only 100 uh, micromole per meter squared per second lighting capacity. Uh, then if we multiply the number of fixtures needed by the, the cost per fixture, um, in the case of the high pressure sodium lights in Minneapolis, uh, the total fixture cost would be $222,000 or about $5 per square foot. Um, in the case of the LED bars, each individual one is, is quite a bit more energy efficient. Um, but because the light output, overall they're only 200 watts, um, so the light output is still on each individual fixture basis uh, quite a bit lower than the high pressure sodium lights. Um, and so we need 1300 fixtures in Minneapolis and 653 fixtures in Richmond. Um, so in Minneapolis, we're looking at uh, half a million dollar installation cost for the LED bars. Um, and in Richmond, just over a quarter million dollars. So how about the electricity consumption? Um, so to have these fixtures on for the required number of hours per year, um, we calculated we'd need about 1.26 uh, kilowatt hours per year in Minneapolis for the high pressure sodium lights. Um, because we do have higher energy um, efficacy for the LED bars, we only need about half as much um, electricity. So instead of a cost of $132,000 a year for electricity for high pressure sodium lights, we're looking at $68,000 per year for the LED bars. So a cost of about $1.58 per square foot per year instead of $3 per square foot per year. Um, in Richmond, um, we, have, uh, we only need half as many fixtures per acre. They are on for um, slightly more hours than Minneapolis just because they are half the output. Um, so our electrical cost is $75,000 for the high pressure sodium lights and $39,000 a year for the LED bars. So then um, uh, the, I guess the question would be, um, what's the return on investment or what's the value of paying more upfront for the LED bars, but having this uh, cheaper electricity cost? Um, and so we can do this uh, simple payback uh, for LED adoption. Um, I call this a simple payback because um, we only take into account the, the difference in the fixture cost um, and our electricity savings per year. Um, what this doesn't account for are differences in installation cost and maintenance cost. Um, in the case of LEDs, you can't uh, replace a bulb. Um, in the case of high pressure sodium lights, you can replace a bulb, but you would have some labor and um, bulb cost associated with that. Um, and so the best way to answer some of these more complex questions is to work with the lighting manufacturer um, to look at the, the light installation plan um, and um, work with the contractor to get a quote for the installation cost. Um, so if we look at this uh, simple payback, um, we look in the case of uh, Minneapolis, the difference in fixture cost was um, $6.88 per square foot. So if I back up for a second, that is um, the difference between $11.99 um, per square foot um, and subtract uh, $5.11 per square foot. Um, so the difference in fixture cost is $6.88 per square foot. Um, however, our electricity savings is $1.46 per square foot. So if we divide the two, 688 divided by 146, our simple payback is 4.7 years. So if we operate these 
these lights for the 2,500 um, uh, hours per year. And on 4.7 years, um, we'll have uh, if the cost, uh, the increased capital cost of the LEDs will have paid for themselves with our savings in electricity. In the case of um, Richmond with these LED bars, um, the difference in the fixture cost per square foot was $3.44. Again, remember this is with uh, installed lighting capacity that was half of the, the Minneapolis installed lighting capacity. Our electrical savings is 84 cents per square foot per year and our payback in this scenario was actually uh, 4.1 years. Um, the case, in this case, the reason why it's a little bit shorter than Minneapolis is because um, we only have half the installed lighting capacity, but then we operate these lights for more hours per year. Um, so because of that, our um, payback is a bit cheaper or a bit shorter. Um, I should point out that um, the prices for manufacturers would be the sticker price. Um, you can often get bulk discounts. Um, and then the other thing that you might have available to you are incentives from um, energy utility companies in your area to adopt energy efficiency practices, or there are federal grant programs like the REAP program, the Renewable Energy um, for Agriculture program. So that could help reduce the upfront cost of adopting new lighting technology and allow you to um, see a, a shorter payback, which could could uh, make more sense for your bottom line. Um, I want to just end with AJ had some really great information on um, uh, lettuce and tomatoes. And so if you increase the light on the expected yield benefit that you could get for that crop, and then one could calculate the kind of the value of light in terms of, or the, or the cost of, of light per kilogram for the crop. So this often, um, uh, it takes advantage of the linear uh, response between crops and light. We often call that the 1% rule. So the, the uh, mantra that we follow is that a 1% decrease in light level on average gives you a 1% decrease in crop yield. Um, and we always say that's, that's within bounds. So if you get to some uh, very high light level, um, additional light doesn't give you much benefit. So we have to look at the bounds that we think about that crop. Um, so uh, a couple of colleagues and I were curious recently about um, whether the 1% rule actually holds up. Um, and we were pleased to find in the literature, um, Leo Marcellus at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands um, has a nice uh, review paper from 2006 where he has looked at several studies with different types of crops and then looked at um, does the 1% the rule hold up. So um, in this table, he has the yield reduction at 1% less light. Um, and so in the case of lettuce, 1% uh, less light actually only gave us 0.8% less um, yield. So not quite a 1%, one to one uh, linear percentage. Um, in the case of fruiting crops, um, it varied by study based on 0.7 to, to 1%. Um, and in the case of bulb crops, um, where there might be a lot of stored energy in the bulb, um, the, that mantra did not necessarily show up. So, so I point this out just so that you think about for um, crops that you're considering uh, lighting, um, it is important to do some more research and figure out what is the actual yield benefit to your crop, um, adding that additional light, um, and also making sure that there's not other factors uh, such as temperature, um, maybe low carbon dioxide could be an issue, that there's other factors that aren't limiting production in your greenhouse so that you can uh, realize the full potential of LED lighting. Um, and before we stop for questions, um, I just want to point out that um, both AJ and myself um, work on another uh, project with uh, that's a USDA specialty crops uh, research initiative project. This one is called hortlamp.org, uh, and LAMP stands for Lighting Approaches to Maximize Profits. Um, so economics and, um, and determining um, uh, which lighting decisions make the most economic sense for growers is a large part of this project. Uh, this project is um, led by Mark Van Eerzel, who's uh, professor at the University of Georgia, um, and our overall goal 
goals in the project are to develop methods that optimize crop growth and quality in cost-effective ways. For example, one of my grad students is looking at the use of far red light in the early seedling stage to promote um, leafy elongation and early establishment of crops. Um, other goals include lighting controllers to implement these strategies, sensors for monitoring crop growth and physiology, um, working with economists to assess whether supplemental lighting is economical, and if so, what, what types of supplemental lighting, and then um, colleagues at the USDA ARS in Toledo, Ohio, um, are using uh, are adopting virtual grower to simulate different lighting uh, scenarios. Um, and you can find more about this project from hortlamp.org. Um, the University of Georgia has, we have colleagues on this project from the Impact Evaluation Unit um, that may be sending you a, a survey by email that would take about five to 10 minutes of your time. So if you feel so inclined, we'd love to have you fill out the survey um, and provide feedback that we can use to improve our project. Um, in talking about lighting, there's a really great um, resource that both AJ and I are co-authors on some of the chapters in this book, which is uh, Light Management in Controlled Environments that came out in 2007 um, by Meister Media. And so it has a really nice discussion on how light impacts plants, but then really practical information for lots of different crops on their crop responses to uh, light, either for uh, photosynthesis, um, for uh, photoperiod control, as well as controlling plant um, uh, form and morph morphogenesis. Great, and at that point I want to um, uh, stop and thank you. And uh, AJ and I will welcome any questions that come up in the chat. We'll try to address them here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, AJ. Uh, great presentation. Before we jump to the questions, and we have a lineup of questions uh, right now, AJ has been answering some of them online. So for all of you on the webinar, uh, you can check the Q&A box. You'll see that some of the answers were already, uh, some of the questions were already answered. Let me share the results from the poll that we provided at the beginning. Uh, so just to have a sense on our audience right now, uh, the majority of the people attending the webinar today were lighting manufacturers and service providers. Uh, from the growers that we had on the call today, the majority of them were growing leafy greens and microgreens, followed by cannabis and hemp. And then from the growers using supplemental lighting, the majority of them were using indoor farm, uh, they were indoor farmers using LED lighting systems, uh, followed by greenhouse growers with HID supplemental lighting systems. So just some information give some context now that you're going to go for the questions. Um, so let me start with the first one here. AJ, you, you mentioned that you would address the first one on the Q&A, uh, a question about the drivers. Would you like to address that question? And uh, let, me, let me read the question to everyone and then you can answer. So the, the question is, the costing study is not only for the light and does not take any consideration the losses in the driver. Is that correct? Drivers also dissipate heat and have extra cost. AJ, would you like to comment? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Um, that, that's a that's a good point. Um, it, it's something that you can add to the calculations fairly easily once you've calculated or measured how much the driver is contributing. Um, I think it's important to mention that we recognize that the uh, examples that we've given are specific to the calculations that we've done and to the assumptions that we've made for those calculations. We're not saying that uh, they will be applicable to any uh, installation in any particular situation. It's just uh, given to you as an example and specific cases will require adjustments to the calculations to make sure we capture, for example, specific driver losses to make sure we calculate uh, the results correctly. Thank you. Uh, AJ, just a follow-up question here. When you do calculate the efficacy of the lamps, the micromole per joule, uh, you are measuring how many photons are being outputted by the fixture by the energy consumption. So it, it does take in consideration the losses on driver and ballasts in between. Is that right? Yeah, for the efficacy calculations, we take that into consideration. You're correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right, so moving to the next one. The next question on our Q&A box is, 
what are the plant physiology implications for tomatoes grown in DLI around 15? So Neil, you, you provide a table with some suggested DLIs from different crops. Would you like to take a shot on this one? Sure, we've done uh, some research at Cornell growing tomatoes at different daily light integrals. Um, and uh, some years ago, we had an experiment where tomatoes were at 10 moles uh, per meter squared per day versus 20 moles per meter squared per day. Um, and one of the, the main indications or, or uh, differences is just the yield was, was less than half for the, the 10 mole treatment. Um, and the overall, um, if you look at the overall vigor and growth of the crop, the, like the, the above ground biomass of the crop, was just much lower at um, 10 moles versus 20 moles. So, so one could still grow decently healthy into tomatoes, um, but if you're going to pay to heat the greenhouse, but to have very low yields, um, it probably uh, wouldn't make sense under our um, winter conditions with, with 10 moles here. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, now, one more directed to AJ, I guess, which is how would you account for percentage light loss as it relates to fixture form factor versus the square footage uh, of grown area in a typical vertical CEA grown rack setup. Uh, would this require a PPFD footprint of the rack's frame? Um, yes, uh, you would like to uh, uh, take some measurements to, to figure out how much light is lost in that system. Um, so yes, I would I would recommend that you do that calculation and then determine your own percentage of loss and use that in the calculations. Perfect, thanks AJ. Another question, and I think this one can go for both of you. Another discussion point is that the current method does not incorporate the spectral effect on crop yield and quality. Uh, so I think both of you cover a lot of lighting quantity, uh, not so much lighting quality. Any comments about that? We don't have to go too deep, but any general comments about that? Sure, I, I could start with a couple comments. Um, one is that in a, in a greenhouse with a background of sunlight, we often don't find so many um, effects of spectral quality. Um, so for example, I have a, a recent master's student, Erica Hernandez, that just published a paper where we grew head lettuce under high pressure sodium light versus uh, red blue LEDs. Um, and with maybe uh, one exception for, for these several varieties of lettuce, um, is so long as we provided the same quantity of light, we didn't see any difference in yield um, between, um, based on light source. Um, uh, often in, in more like soul source lighting applications, you can see a greater effect on um, spectrum. Um, and so, uh, the, if, if we're all, one were to include that, so you can, you can get um, different types of growth with a, with a bit of far red light, um, or you could get more compact growth, but lower uh, yield with, um, with higher blue light. Um, so those, those become more complicated questions. And then I think you have to work with the lighting manufacturer to see what are the, the spectral effects of the, the lighting source in terms of the yield that you could expect with your crop. Perfect. Thanks, Neil. Um, so another one, I think that's a quick one. It's uh, more a note for AJ. AJ, someone is asking, where can we find a copy of the spreadsheet AJ was using for the cost calculations? Is this available somewhere that people can use? It's not available, but uh, if people want to send me an email, I'd be happy to share that with them. Perfect. Uh, so for all of you who register for the webinar, I think the easiest way uh, you can re outreach to me and I can resend the questions or you can go straight for AJ and you. It's, it's really up to you. All right, uh, another one, besides the 1% yield decrease with a lower DLI, what other implications might I see to know uh, that my plants are not getting enough light? So what, what would be the other symptoms that they can realize plants are not getting enough light? For instance, what would the plant physiologically look like? Flavor. Mm -hmm. right. So, what would be the initial indicate? How to diagnose? I guess is the question that they're being under illuminated. So, uh, a couple of the diagnostic factors. So, one is that with lower light, 
you can get a, a taller plant or, or taller internode elongation. So that's that those low light levels in that case are triggering the shade avoidance responses from the plant. So plants in nature growing under shade, when they detect that, um, they have uh, a signal to grow taller to try to reach um, sunlight. So for example, if I grow uh, lettuce seedlings in the winter time in my greenhouse without supplemental light, the seedlings are very tall and elongated. Um, instead of having a more compact, kind of stockier, beefier plant, um, if we look at uh, crops where we want branching, um, if we have um, higher light levels, we'll have better branching of the plant. Um, so we'd, we could think of like hydroponic basil in this case. And if you have lower light levels, you're going to have poor branching of the plant. Uh, again, due to those shade avoidance responses, um, it's triggering one main stem of the plant to grow much taller and um, not favoring um, new lateral branches to, um, to grow. Neil, do you have uh, just a quick follow-up? Would be, is there any documented flavor effects on that uh, that we can say at this time or too general? Right, right. So um, uh, last week I was just at a strawberry workshop um, and uh, one of the, we're talking about greenhouse grown strawberries. One of the, the diagnostic indicators of um, low light is you also have lower carbohydrate supply in the fruit. Um, and so you can have, so in things like tomatoes and strawberries, you could have lower sugar content or uh, we measure that as bricks. Um, so you could have um, lower bricks content or lower sugar content if um, you have low light levels. Okay, great. I think we have one more. And just for all of you that are still here, we still have a little bit, just, just short of 100 people participating. We can extend this for 10 more minutes, try to get all these questions answered. So if you're enjoying the conversation, please stay with us. Uh, one more that we have here, that's more towards uh, the content from AJ, uh, which is saying light fixture amount is of course based on light fixture height and light angle uh, from the light plan. But your spreadsheet show an indication of amount fixture based on PPFD or DLI level required. Do you take in account light plan, for example, height, uh, the spread of the light, etc., or it would be better to give a PPFD on canopy light indication only? So, what would be the preconditions, I guess, AJ, for those measurements that you presented today? So the uh, the approach that we took was we um, we just looked at the light out the light intensity received at canopy level for a particular crop. So we didn't look at how that light was distributed. The only thing we took in consideration was how much light would not reach the crop. So that's the light loss percentage that I that I mentioned. Uh, so with those uh, numbers, the light loss and the intensity that you expect to receive at canopy level, you can do all the calculations. Now, whether an actual system is actually performing that way is a different question. And I rec recommend that anybody who has a lighting system does some measurements themselves with a uh, with the appropriate light sensor to make sure that indeed uh, the system is performing as as uh, advertised. And that's not always the case. Perfect. So I guess what would you suggest, AJ, if a specific grower wants to find this question or answer this question for their specific needs? Uh, what would be the steps to follow? Thank you. So the, I think the best thing to do would be, sorry. Go ahead, AJ. Yeah. The best thing would be to, to uh, make a light map. So you, you identify the height or that the canopy is going to be at, typically the top of the canopy, and you, you lay out a grid uh, and you collect data uh, along the intersections of the grid lines. And then you get a pretty good idea of the distribution of the light from a particular uh, source. And that way you can tell how evenly it, the light is distributed and how much light is actually uh, spread beyond the growing area. How, in other words, how much light you would lose from a particular fixture. I think that's the best approach to try to get a good sense of how a particular lamp is performing. Sure. Uh, Neil, would you like to comment? Yeah, I was going to mention that so, so that um, distribution of light is a really important question. Um, and it can be quite variable. So even in, in our uh, research settings at Cornell, um, we have cases where 
the light levels that we measure on a bench can vary by twofold. So like directly under the light, we get twice as much light. And then in the corners, we get, we get half as much light. Um, so it is, it is really important. You could work with your lighting manufacturer to get these light distribution maps. Um, as well, you could work with the, the lighting supplier to look at some scenarios of, okay, if we, we space them differently, or if we have more lights, um, even on the edges and corners to, so that we have good light levels, even on the edges and corners, but at that expense, then you can look at the, the pros and cons of um, adding those additional lights. Um, and the, the penalty for your crop would also depend on your system. So um, some of the uh, leafy greens hydroponic systems, the crop actually moves through the greenhouse, such as a, an automated NFT system or a, or a raft pond uh, hydroponics, where, where plants are transplanted on one end of the greenhouse and then the rafts or the NFT channels move forward a little bit each day and then end up at the, at the other side of the greenhouse. The nice thing is if there's uneven light distribution in, in that type of scenario, um, because your crop's moving ahead a little bit each day, um, it will hopefully kind of get that average uh, light level as it moves through the greenhouse. Perfect. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense from both of you. And just because it's not complicated enough, let's complicate a little bit more. There is a, there's a nice question here that can complicate things a little bit more, which is, uh, I have an Apogee Park quantum light sensor. How do you recommend to best use it through the canopy of my tomato crop if I want to know the level of light loss through the foliage? What should I have as my DLI at the top uh, of the plant if I want to have enough DLI at the fruit level of my high wire crop? Uh, good luck, presenters. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I'll point out, and then, um, then I might toss this question to AJ, is when we talk about the target light levels, here we're talking about at the top of the crop canopy. Um, so if we we're trying to achieve, say, 25 moles of light for tomatoes, that would be at the top of the, the plant canopy. Um, AJ, do you want to address light distribution through uh, the plant canopy? Like yeah, so this here? is an issue that uh, we have also, from a research point of view, uh, thought about and are trying to address. Uh, you probably know that uh, in these taller crops, um, uh, some manufacturers are recommending to install LED bars. Uh, that's a the common practice uh, for some tomato growers. They have over top lighting uh, or, or uh, uh, either high pressure sodium or LEDs, and then they add additional LED bars within the canopy, uh, usually about halfway up. And uh, that has shown to, to be a distinct benefit. Uh, but how you assess the light intensity is a whole different question, and it gets more complicated when you are in a greenhouse where you not only have your um, electric light sources, but you also have sunlight and the sunlight is moving throughout the day. This, the position of the sun moves throughout the day. Uh, and that, that means that your light condition is continually fluctuating throughout the day and throughout the season, throughout the year. So that becomes a very difficult challenge to really assess the light. What I would recommend you do is you, you find a reference point for yourself. So if you wanted to measure what the light intensity was in a particular location in the canopy, you try to assess that regularly and use that as your reference and then determine based on your observations on the crop whether uh, you need to increase or decrease that, that light intensity at that level. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, that's a complicated one. So I think we I don't want to extend too much more. We have three other questions here. Uh, we're not going to be able to address all of them individually but they're all related uh, to the effects of heat, heat loss from the LED light systems or the HID light systems uh, in relation to how you manage this in the greenhouse. Uh, some of the questions talk about if you can capture that and use for something else, or what are the impacts of going from an HID lighting system, going to an, uh, from an HID to an LED lighting system, and this difference in temperature, the ambient air, how to manage that. So. Uh, would both of you would like to comment something about or what have you seen or how to manage this difference in, in temperature due to the, the wasted heat from the HADs to the LED light systems? Sure. Um, so the, the big difference between high pressure sodium or HID lamps and LED lamps is that HID lamps, high pressure sodium metal halide, produce radiant heat. 
uh, mostly radiant heat. And that means that um, there's a, as long as there's direct line of sight between the, the lamp and the canopy, that radiant heat will, will come from the lamp and will be hitting the canopy surfaces. And that's difficult to deal with because as long as the la lamp is on and that direct line of sight is present, that radiation will occur. What happens with LED lamps, as you know, they typically have heat sinks, and that means that they uh, produce what we call uh, convective heat. In other words, the air around the heat sink will heat up and will slowly move away from the lamp. Sometimes we use a fan to, to help that process. So it could be an active cooling with an active fan, or it could be passive cooling when we just use heat sinks. Uh, but we produce with, with LED lamps, we produce mostly convective heat. And that convective heat is a lot easier to deal with because it's just warm air. And we know how to deal with warm air in greenhouses. We move that air away. We can move it to the outside or uh, move it away from an area where we grow our plants. So the convective heat that's produced by LED lamps is typically easier to deal with than the radiant heat that is produced by uh, HID lamps. And that's a big difference, and therefore uh, we can now bring LED lamps much closer to a canopy because we don't have that radiant heat. We just have to make sure we move enough air through or around the canopy to make sure we can remove that heat. Uh, so the management becomes a little easier when you have LED lamps. Uh, but again, it, the heat can be a hinder or can be a benefit depending on what the crop uh, is looking for. If the crop needs extra heat, then having that extra heat there is, is, is good. If the crop does not need the extra heat, then you need to make sure you can remove it. And again, uh, removing it when you have HID lamps is very challenging because if you do that, you block uh, the, the, the useful light coming to the canopy as well. Wonderful, KJ. Thanks for the answer. I think we can do one more and then it would be good. Uh, that's a cool one, relates a little bit to data collection in real time. So the question is, would it be good to have a DLI measurement sensor recorder or a power meter uh, that can record sun, sunlight plus LED lighting to avoid possible big gap between the historical data DLI and the actual real time data? Uh, measurements from crops view, uh, in other words. So measuring what's actually happening in the greenhouse versus predictions uh, and historical data. Uh, any comments about that? I think it, it's certainly useful to log daily light integral in your own location. So a lot of um, the environmental control manufacturers for greenhouses, they'll install a weather station outside. Um, which I somewhat question related to how, how you use outside measurements to control what's actually happening to your crop. But the one nice thing that it gives you is unshaded values of, um, of global radiation, of, to of total sunlight. And then um, there, there are conversion factors where you can convert that to um, the daily light integral in terms of photosynthetically active radiation. So that could be one way to do it. Um, as a plant scientist, I always like also knowing what your plants are actually getting. So have having a quantum sensor installed in a representative location in your greenhouse to log what the, the crop is actually getting. Um, and then to, um, to the point of this question specifically, um, there are ways, so if you, if, you if you log, if your environmental control system is logging when your lights turn on and when they turn off, you could um, just subtract, so if you measure total light level that your crop is getting, which could be sunlight plus the supplemental lights, you could subtract out the amount that they get from uh, supplemental light based on the time logs, um, and then um, account for that to determine just your ambient daily light integral that you get from the sun in the greenhouse, which would then be really valuable information both for your current crop as well as to keep for historical records. Perfect, thanks, Neil. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the webinar. I think this is time to go. We've been 50 minutes over the time here. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much, AJ, for the great presentation, great discussion. Would you have any final comments before we say goodbye? Thanks, everyone. It's been um, a nice conversation. If anybody, wants, yeah. if anybody wants to contact us, feel, feel free to send us an email. Perfect. Well, thanks everyone for attending the webinar. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, Neil, for presenting. And I see everyone on our next webinar uh, scheduled for March 12, 
uh, which will be about influence of temperature and daily light integral on culinary or production, presented by Dr. Roberto Lopez and PhD student Kelly Walters from Michigan State University. Thanks, everyone, and I see you in a month from now. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye now.